Hey, what's up fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and I am really excited about today's video because it's all about how to extract inspiration for knitting from Instagram. Now, I talk a pretty big game about how my knitting ethos sort of revolves around making knitwear with utility. And of course, mindfulness and sustainability are pieces of the practice that are on my radar, but ultimately I want to make knits, specifically garments, that are practical, wearable, work with my personal style, all those things. And then another thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently in terms of my crafting, which hopefully is evidenced by some of my more recent videos, like underrated knitting patterns for summer. Uh, it's really how social media is influencing my own knitting practice and how the content that I am creating and sharing on social media is influencing the knitting practices of people who consume my content. So I'm not really saying anything like new or revelational, re revelational, sure. <laughs> when I say that like the knitting niche on Instagram or social media is subject to the same kinds of influences and trend cycling that we see in other niches on social media. And like this isn't at all a bad thing. Like I'm really intrigued by the role that social media has played in the growth of craft-based industries the past couple of years, specifically in terms of making starting small businesses a lot more viable for, for folks. Um, because like, I know the fiber industry is like old and like steeped in tradition. I'm not saying like, ooh, it's a new industry all of a sudden, um, but just like social media has been a really big factor in what we know to be the knitting industry today, or at least how I experience the knitting industry today. So anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to do today is sort of walk through how I actually engage with Instagram posts to find inspiration and really sort of dissect these posts, pick out what elements of these posts resonate with me and how I use those elements to make intentional choices for my knitting practice that align with my knitting goals. For the intents and purposes of this video, I'm only going to be doing photos where the knits are actually being modeled by the designer or the knitter who created them. Uh, but when it comes to the kinds of photos, and I'm sitting on the left side of the screen so that I can insert all the photos here. Uh, when it comes to the kinds of photos where it's just the knit, uh, like on a hanger, basically, um, my first question is always, what does that look like on a body? And from there, I'll follow most of the same process I'll walk through today. Um, yeah, and a couple other general notes before jumping in. I'd recommend following the hashtags for any of the patterns you encounter on Instagram and you're interested in, because that's just a matter of having data, you know? The more you see, a pattern on different bodies and different fibers with different kinds of modifications, uh, the more just information you'll have to help you figure out if that's going to work for you or not. Looking at these posts, I'm specifically going to be paying attention to the knits, obviously, so the construction of the knit, the fit, the fibers qualities, so the appearance what I suspect the look and feel and drape of the yarns are going to be the color. How is the knit styled? What is it being worn with? Uh, and also how the photo is framed and like what the actual features of the photo itself are that are contributing to its aspirational or inspirational quality. All right. I'm just kind of like reading through my notes here <laughs> before I actually get into analyzing any of these posts. I want to apologize for the incessant beeping. I think someone's laundry is done and they have to come get it. So if you hear that sporadically, apologies. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to say that all of these like assessments 
are really based off of my own opinions and personal styles. None of what I say is meant to be a critique or critical or negative. Um, again, just based off of my own personal style, which even that I could be saying something today, which I don't agree with in a year's time because my personal style is evolving with my lifestyle and my personal tastes and how I am influenced by trend cycles and all of those things. So that's that. For reference, I would describe my own personal style as an attempt at being effortlessly put together. Uh, so I'm often in like trousers and a t-shirt or jeans and a blazer. Uh, overall, I like relatively minimalistic looks. Uh, relatively low contrast looks as well. So I'm more likely to be found in all black than black and white. I'm more likely to pair light gray with light wash denim than black, sort of things like that. Uh, and I also try to play with proportions a bit, which for me often looks like something really oversized and flowy and drapey with something a lot more fitted or tailored. And I think to actually look at things on Instagram and dissect them and figure out what elements of an outfit or a knit or a photo sort of resonate with you, it can be helpful to have some descriptors for your own personal style. And I think for the most part, it's not too difficult to like look at something and be like, yes, that's something that I like, or no, that's something I do not like. But it can be a lot more difficult to sort of identify an overall personal style aesthetic, mostly because most of us don't really fall into like just cottage core or just light academia or just dark academia or just Gen Z maximalism. I don't, I don't know. Most of the times we sort of have personal styles that reflect a mix of influences. So what I would suggest doing if you are interested in figuring out some like key descriptors for your own personal style is just document what you wear for a couple of weeks. Uh, take photographs of your outfits, especially if you are wearing your knitwear. And at the end of a couple of weeks, maybe even a month, go back through those photos and look for the similarities and differences uh, between the outfits. What are the basic pieces that you wear most often because they're really easy? What are the staple pieces, which may or may not be basics, that you tend to build your outfits around? What are your most worn statement pieces? Do you use different iterations of the same outfit formula, like jeans and a t-shirt? Is there a silhouette that seems to work really well for you? Which of the outfits do you remember feeling the most confident in? Uh, do you have a discernible color palette that you like to work within? Or do any colors really stick out to you as being uh, more flattering or giving you more dopamine than, than others? Just sort of probing yourselves with these kinds of general questions that don't really force you to categorize your style into any specific kind of aesthetic. Um, I think it's really important because if you can articulate or describe what your personal style is in a few words, then I think it will be easier to figure out what it is about this Instagram content that is really clicking for you. So after 10 minutes, I am going to get into the first photo. First photo is a really recent upload from Petite Knit. And even though it's not really like the knits that are featured in this photo, uh, I wanted to talk about how she's styling her knits. So she's wearing her champagne cardigan tied around her body and her Marie clutch. Now, part of Petite Knits brand, I think, is how effortlessly put together she always seems to be. She's 
knitting at cafes with pastries and she's being a mom to all her little kiddos and she's a prolific knitter and she's running arguably one of the most prosperous knitting businesses I am aware of at the moment. Uh, and I think this look captures that really, really well. This look has a really fresh feeling that is playing into this coastal grandmother aesthetic that people are really talking about a lot this spring slash summer. Uh, and I think that's really highlighted by the like feminine frill on her white linen top and the pearls that she is wearing. But I think that by having the cardigan tied around her body in this more asymmetrical style, takes like the preppy traditional like cardigan draped over the shoulders look and undoes it a bit. I think it relaxes the look a little bit. Also with the jeans and the pointed toe loafers, uh, I think it's just a bit more contemporary and a little bit less like stuffy. I don't wanna like equate stuffy with preppy, but I do think it just gives the look a bit more of a cool vibe than a preppy vibe. Not saying that preppy's not cool. Really, really like this look. I think it's also a very effective post because it's showing another way to style a cardigan that isn't just like, oh, layer it with a pair of jeans and a t-shirt or put it over a dress. Uh, and so I think just having more options for how to style your own knitwear is also good for having inspiration for not just like the knits we want to make, but what we want to do with the knits that we have. For myself, I would probably put together a similar look, but I would swap the clutch bag for a tote bag. I would probably opt for a t-shirt in a bit more of a classic cut, like something without the feminine ruffle. Um, I think it's a little more cute and pretty than what I might wear on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and if I'm really getting nitpicky, uh, I might, if I had the option, choose a pair of like beige flats or sandals um, or something with more of a brown tone than black for the footwear, simply because there's no other black in the look, but that's me being like really, really nitpicky. So that's photo number one, look number one. I am going to go stop that beeping in the washing machine. <sighs> look number two, also petite knit. They're not all gonna be petite knit though, I promise. Uh, but I wanted to talk about this photo because it's the sweater that broke knitting internet, I think. In this photo, she's wearing her pretty famous terrazzo sweater in the notoriously difficult to get a hold of Noro Silk Garden Sock in the colorway S1 Omitama. I think, I think I've only seen one person, Tiffany Liu from Typical Bliss, be able to get a hold of this and Tiffany is very committed when she wants a yarn and she does a deep dive for it, which is very impressive what she's able to find. Um, so yeah, aside from the yarn, key design feature of this sweater is really like the large fold over turtleneck, which I think is done in twisted rib. Uh, and I don't have the pattern for this sweater, but if I understand the Ravelry page correctly, it's got some kind of modified raglan shoulder construction. And Petite Knit wears hers with a lot of positive ease. Uh, and in many of the photos where she's actually wearing this terrazzo sweater, uh, you can see that the sleeves are really elongated on her body, like they cover her whole hand pretty much. Uh, and indeed, the pattern page does say that it's meant to be worn with about 14 centimeters of positive ease. So that's about six inches, just shy of six inches, I think. But yeah, I love everything about this, the way that this knit looks fit wise. It looks really, really cozy. In terms of how she has it styled, the shorts and the comfortable sandals, like the Birkenstocks, part of my summer uniform. Casual, easy, no problems. 
So for me, it's a, it's a check for styling. Although there probably aren't a lot of times where I'd want a wool and mohair turtleneck paired with shorts and sandals. But for like a brisk morning on a beach, on the cliff side, it makes sense. Uh, I have seen her style this sweater with something like jeans also, just a much more realistic way of styling things that I'd go for. Uh, but the way she has it styled here really is contributing to sort of the story that the photo is telling. And along with that story, next is the, the shot itself. So obviously if you put somebody on a cliff, buy some calm water and some foliage at sunrise or sunset, you'll probably get a pretty decent photo out of that. And while I don't know a whole ton about photography, I am going to take a crack at it. If I understand the rule of thirds well enough, there are three horizontal sections in this photo. There's the sky, there's the water, and then there's where she's standing, the cliff and the foliage. And each part of her body, her legs, her torso, and her head fall into one of these three sections but your eye is drawn to the sweater because it's in the middle of the photo. So this might be like very shop talky, uh, but just breaking down how that photo is framed is something I'm keeping in mind for, uh, well, I mean, not so much my making, but when I'm thinking about maybe how I want to take my own photographs in my own knitwear for finished object kind of shots and things like that. But I'm going to argue, even though the shot is great, the sweater itself is great, what really makes this photo work is the yarn. The colors are playing into the rest of the outfit, the colors are playing into her hair and the clip she has in her hair. It's drawing on the colors in the sky and the water, and overall it kind of reminds me of the, the color play you might expect to see on seashells, which again, is bringing in that sort of story or narrative that the, the photo is trying to tell. But now, here are the butts <laughs> for, for this photo, because it's beautiful. I love it. I want to be in that moment. Here are the butts. I don't know how wearable a turtleneck of that size will be for me. Perhaps it might depend on the fibers I choose to knit, if it will be comfortable, but even in terms of seasonality, um, I don't know that I necessarily spend enough time in the cold. Like, yes, it gets really cold in Toronto, but then you have heating on when you're indoors most of the time. Uh, so how wearable or how much wear I would be able to get out of a turtleneck that big is probably debatable. So right there, that's enough for me to say, maybe this isn't going to be the most like good match for me as far as knitwear utility goes. And I also wonder if I would like this particular knit as much in a yarn that doesn't have the same kind of visual interest as the Noro Silk Garden Sock Solo. That said, if you are interested in knitting this, can't get a hold of the Noro. Um, I did try to poke around for some other color changing yarn alternatives. Uh, so there's the Chopelle Wool, 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 I'm not 100% sure, uh, the, the Zauerball Crazy Yarn. Uh, there's Cascade 220 Wave, which is definitely like a lot more dark moody colorways compared to specifically the Omitama that she's knit her sample in. And then if you have the money, <laughs> Spin Cycle Yarns Dyed in the Wool or their moody counterpart Nocturne could be a good option. Or if you can find the Plymouth Yarns Mushishi, that's a worsted weight. Uh, that would be a good option if you wanted to get gauge without needing mohair. The closest yarn in terms of color changing and colorway that I could find is one of the spin cycle yarns, the dyed in the wool in the colorway, the castle, because it looks like it's a primarily creamy base with like the pastel greens, pinks, purples, and blues. 
blah, blah, blah. So I think that's a good example to show how I would kind of get from like, it's really the yarn that's sticking out to me in this photo. And so taking that as the piece that I do my further research on without like fully committing to knitting a terrazzo sweater in the Noro yarn. Moving on to photo number three, a couple of photos. Um, and maybe I'll also pop in some like scroll throughs of these creators feeds to help give a sense of like, this is the content I'm seeing from them. I don't know. Uh, next photos are from Allie who has knits and gigs on um, Instagram. I really like following Allie. There's a few things she does in her feed that I really like. First thing is she has this like European it girl aesthetic going on that I personally find to be very aspirational. I think most of, if not all of what she does is a good fit or match for my personal style aesthetic. And she does show a lot of how she actually styles her knitwear. And she builds these really cool tonal looks that are based on often neutrals uh, and proportion play. So both things like tonal looks being low contrast and larger proportions, smaller proportions, both, you know, things that I mentioned are on my sort of radar when I'm styling for myself. So in the photos here in particular, she is wearing sweater number 14 by My Favorite Things Knitwear, and she's done this one up in Drops Flora and Kid Silk. So that's great. Those are pretty price accessible yarns because I think the originals knit in one strand of knitting for all of Merino and two strands of their kid silk mohair. So that's soft silk mohair. Uh, so that's going to run you, that's going to be an expensive sweater uh, if you go for that combo. But um, this knit is just super popular. I think like we're talking about the raglan of the moment. We're talking about like maybe the no frill sweater by Petite Knit, maybe the, um, of course I'm not gonna remember the name of it now, but the one by Tin Can Knits, Flax, the Flax Pullover. Uh, like those are the raglans of the moment, but I feel like the drop shoulder of the moment is sweater number 14. Um, and while I prefer the look of a raglan construction on myself, I do appreciate the look of the drop shoulder being a little bit more casual, I think. Um, but that might just be because I have yet to knit a drop shoulder sweater for myself that is like oversized enough for it to work the way I want it to. In these photos, I really like the way the sleeves are also super oversized and they come all the way over the hand and they look really cool and casual with the roll up. Um, but that being said, I don't know how practical sleeves like that are going to be for me if they're left unrolled or if I would find them comfortable without a full base layer long sleeve underneath. Uh, in terms of like oversizedness, I am planning to knit the Hour Pullover by Sari Nordland and I'm going to talk about that sweater later uh, in some photos that I talk about. Uh, but if that doesn't really scratch my oversized sweater itch, then I'll, I'll consider doing a drop shoulder in the future. In terms of styling, amazing. I love the way she has it layered over the fitted cream turtleneck. I think it's really cool and adds this sort of coziness to the look. Uh, depending on the season, you could do a sleeveless turtleneck underneath or a button down like a cotton shirt underneath. Uh, a pair of the skirt jeans really, like it works for anything. Um, but she definitely has it styled in a way that I have styled my own knitwear in the past, right down to like, having on a gold pendant. So it's just very congruous with my own look. Now, the reason why I think it works is again, the yarns 
the fact that the yarns are marled, we have this like mid-tone sandy brown and the lighter cream, I think it helps to balance out the tonal look so that it's not just like really cream forward, but it's also not like there's a really high contrast color blocking situation that's going on. And so I think marling the yarns together uh, can be a good thing to consider if you're like, I want a neutral sweater, but I don't know if I just want beige or if I just want cream or if I want like cream or gray because, and I'm really hoping people have experienced this before. If you ever like tried to put on an all black outfit and you're thinking this is all black, so it should work and it doesn't work because your black pants are a different kind of black than your black top. Like that's the kind of thing I'm thinking that marling the yarns will help to avoid or I just sound completely crazy. I don't know. But for the most part, like you probably know that I, when I'm picking mohairs and wools to pair together, uh, I typically opt for a slightly darker uh, or kind of variegated tonal mohairs to pair with ever so slightly lighter wools because I really like the, the glowing from within look that that gives. I do think that lighter mohairs and darker wools tend to have more of that marling look uh, when they're knit together. And I'm not 100% sure how I feel personally about how marling in my own. If the angle's different, it's because I ran out of storage on my phone. And I also started to get really sweaty, so. I was saying, not 100% sure how I feel about marling in my own knitwear because before I was like, definitely no, that's not for me. Uh, but I think I'm warming up to it because I've seen it done in ways that are appealing to me. Uh, for example, these photos from Knits and Gigs, uh, Petite Knit doing her Technicolor range or my favorite things, knitwear doing her camisole number six and matching shorts by marling two of the different knitting for all of yarns together. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there we go. There's my thought process point of reflection. Uh, but in terms of the framing of this photo, uh, the fact that nothing's competing with the warm tonal sort of thing going on in the mug like it all just screams very cozy to me which I love. Next up we have a photo from Fable Knitwear or Helen and in this photo she is wearing her Giselle blouse. Her whole design aesthetic is very very feminine and very romantic. I think it really appeals to my fantasy self, which is like the style aesthetic that I can imagine myself wearing, but on the day to day, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so my fantasy self wanting to sort of like indulge in these kinds of cottage core or fairy tale esque silhouettes, um, it really appeals to that, that side of my fight style sensibilities, I guess. Um, in terms of framing in this photo, the tile is really helping to tie things together because the greens are complementing the foliage and the yellows complementing like that weedy yellow color of the mohair and her actual hair. In terms of the knit itself, I really like that the body is fitted, ribbed, and looks like it has some kind of rustic texture to it because I think it's offering some really interesting juxtaposition to the dramatic fluffiness of the sleeves. Looks like they're worked up in mohair. And the more I'm looking at this pattern, the more I'm imagining it in like a really nice like rusty kind of red color or forest green color. I think it could be a really beautiful statement knit for like the holiday season, for example. Uh, but really like the showstopper piece of this design here is the huge mohair sleeves. 
But if that is too much for you, if this is something where I'm like, oh my gosh, I really do love this design, but I probably would not wear it. Maybe I would, maybe I would not. Most likely I would not. Then what I would start to think about is what are the mohair forward designs that I could knit alternatively. So for more of a classic minimalistic silhouette, you could look toward things like the Cumulus Blouse by Petite Knit or the Mousseau pattern, which is free from Espace Trico. Or if you want something that's still a little more feminine, you can look at the Cloud Bow, which was in not the most recent Pom Pom magazine, but the last one. There's also the Ghost Whisper by Park and Knit or the Souffle by Penrose Knits. I think all of those have a bit more of an airy, uh, feminine or ethereal quality to them. Uh, and that can be played up by color selection, but it's still a bit less, you know, dramatic or uh, fairy tale esque but still kind of romantic compared to this Giselle Bluffs. Finally, I want to talk about a few photos that feature the Hour Pullover from Sari Nordland. Overall, I really like following Sari Nordland's feed because I think she does an excellent job of highlighting her knits. I think like Petite Knit does a really good job of selling you the aesthetic and the lifestyle that she sort of seems to have and it's very aspirational in that sense. But Sari does a lot of like white backdrops Here's just my whip on a hanger. Here's my finished object on a hanger. And she balances that out really well with very simple modeled photos and also very scenic modeled photos. I also really like that she works within a really discernible color palette. And she's talked in her own podcast before about how she does this purposefully so that her knitwear capsule works with everything else she has in her wardrobe. So that's something I'm always trying to go for as well. And so she works with a lot of creams, beige, caramel, these like rusty squirrel red colors, uh, terracotta, earthy pinks, and neutral or warmer toned purples. So just the fact that she has that really seamless color flow or color play in her feed is very calming to look at, nice to look at, aspirational, I don't know. And moreover, uh, aside from just like the general aesthetics of her feed and her color palette, Sari's design aesthetic I think is a really perfect combination of what my practical day-to-day -day dressing myself up is and the femininity that my fantasy self wants to lean into a bit more. And so I'm going to talk a bit more about these images of the hour pullover because these images essentially sold me on this knit in these yarns. This is an example of I am not using these for inspiration, I am using these photos for imitation. And here's why. This pattern is the bottom-up raglan construction. It's got a lot, a lot of positive ease. So I said the terrazzo was 14 centimeters. This one is 20 to 25 centimeters or eight to 10 inches of positive ease. And for me, that puts me at a size medium or a size three. Uh, sorry, she doesn't have medium, large, etc. in her patterns. Size three in her patterns in terms of the finished measurements. So she's knit her sample in Knitting for Olive, Soft Silk Mohair, and Merino, both I think in the colorway Rose Clay. And for my own version of this sweater, I opted for the same yarns. I chose the Merino in the colorway Marzipan, which is like a neutral cream kind of color, and the colorway Oat for the Soft Silk Mohair, which is like a neutral beige. So we're really going for like a very neutral sweater in my case. And the reason why I opted to indulge in this yarn combination, because it is a bit more expensive than what I would typically try to aim for for a full garment for myself, 
uh, is because I'm really trying to achieve with this sweater, this like everyday luxury kind of feeling. And in fact, like this sweater is called the hour pullover because uh, hour means haze in Finnish, which comes from sort of the halo of the mohair. So that paired with the gauge that the sweater is knit at, it looks like it has this really beautiful, easy drape to it. What I really like about the design is that it has the oversized fit through the body that I'm interested in. And it looks casual and comfortable and laid back, but it also has a really polished feel to it at the same time because there is shaping in the body, so it tapers toward the hem. The sleeves start really wide and also taper towards the wrist where they are fitted. So that's distinct from the sweater number 14 where the sleeve stays quite wide around the wrist. Uh, and I personally really love the look of the folded twisted rib neckline. Um, I know twisted rib is kind of controversial, but in my own knitting, I think my twisted rib tends to look more neat than my regular ribbing, so. Uh, and lastly is the shoulder detail on the sweater. So the way the raglan decreases are worked toward the top of the sleeve uh, keeps it very lateral. And so what I like about that is the raglan shaping isn't cutting across the chest at the front here, which makes it look a little less sweatshirty, if that makes sense. There's just like no interruption. So the way the garment hangs, I think, is a lot more seamless, if that makes any sense. So yeah, in terms of styling and framing, Sari keeps her outfits and, as I mentioned, overall her photos quite simple. But I really appreciate how she styles a lot of her knitwear pieces with the same things in her wardrobe. Black skinny jeans a navy midi skirt and I think that makes it really easy to see yourself in her own knits rather than wondering like for example in the case of the the fable knitwear uh, Giselle books like if I don't have the linen trousers in that cut and color will I be able to achieve the same look um, I think the way she styles her knits is very accessible in that sense so those are all of the photos I wanted to walk through today. I, I hope you enjoyed this sort of vignette case study in my own thought process, how I use Instagram to find inspiration for my own knitting practice, or just kind of the things I think about when I'm making decisions on what I will make for myself. Um, when I had mentioned this as an idea for a video, folks had seemed really excited about it, so I hope it delivered. Uh, and if you liked this video, do like leave me a comment. Feel free to send me photos if you want me to like make this a recurring thing. Maybe I could start like breaking down photos that you folks send to me that like you're really interested in, and maybe if you have questions in particular, I could try to answer them. Not like I'm an expert or anything like that, but I don't know. I thought this was a lot of fun. Um, definitely a bit of a challenge for me to put the things I think into words, but I don't know, I had fun doing this. I really struggle to finish videos, so Thanks for hanging out with me as per usual. Until I get to see you again, I am wishing you all health and happy knitting. Bye everyone.